Good evening and welcome. It is time once again for CU Immigration here on WRFULP 104.5 FM. I will be your host for this evening. My name is Mr. Garza, and I am here to let you know that WRFU is an open forum for the Abana Champaign community. Views expressed are those of the speakers and are not necessarily representative of WRFU, UCIMC, or, as we like to say on the televised version of this show, UPTV. These views are our own, and by our in this instance, if not in any other, I mean myself, my guests, or anyone whose words I might happen to read during the show. And speaking of guests, today we have Lisa Wilson, Executive Director of the Refugee Center in Champaign, Illinois. Lisa is here to talk to us about the center's work with refugees as well as with immigrants generally. We'll discuss the kinds of services they offer, plus what they hope to be able to do with their new grant. In particular, how the addition of more extensive translation services will also benefit many other aspects of their work. We also talk about how some members of the community can help the Refugee Center in their work and some of the outreach activities the center has planned in the upcoming weeks. I hope you'll stick with us and enjoy the show. Thank you. About seven years ago, mm -hmm. there was a man um, in the area whose name is Don Meyer, and he worked in Afghanistan um, with a number of, of gentlemen over there that he got to know. And they were working for, I'm not sure if it was an American company, um, if it was directly for the military or for or an American company, but um, then the Afghan gentlemen were qualified to apply for what's called a special immigrant visa, mm. meaning that they had worked with or for the U.S. government or U.S. companies in some capacity. Um, they had gone through a lot of paperwork, a lot of permissions, a lot of, um, you know, crossing the I, or crossing the T's and dotting the I's interviews. Um, and they, under the, um, the Afghan Immigrant Act of, of 2009, they qualified to come over here as special immigrant visa holders. Mm. So once they got that, they named Mr. Meyer as their U.S. tie. Yeah. And that's how they, they started to come here. And then as more and more families came, then they named the first arriving families as their U.S. ties and, and began to um, create a little community here. So when, mm -hmm. um, when the evacuation happened in August and we started talking with our partners at the U.S. Catholic Conference of, of Bishops, we knew that we had to reach out to our former clients um, to see if they could interpret for us mm -hmm. um, on an hourly basis. And so we've done that since October. And just recently in the last month, we actually hired um, Sadia Rahman, who is working for us as a past two case manager. Oh. So she will be able to help manage um, the services along with the Afghan resettlement team to manage the services that are received by the Afghan population. Mm. So yes, when we do encounter a need for an additional language, we, we reach out. Um, we have an HR specialist that we work with um, from time to time who helps um, tremendously to identify suitable candidates. Um, with Kahobal, it's been really difficult because I think there are so few speakers that I believe all of the organizations in the area actually turn to one or, you know, one of three people who actually do interpretation and we all kind of work with them a little bit here and there. So, mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's been, uh, it's been very difficult and that's why uh, Pixan Konab is part of, of this, um, um, this grant because they uh, there's a real need to develop um, more um, training for people to, to be able to speak and translate in indigenous languages. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you you guys have really have your hands full <laughs> and then some. Uh, is there some way that the people in the community who are do not have some special skill mm -hmm. can be helpful to you or, or supportive of your work? Sure. There are a lot of um, faith-based organizations and other community organizations like the Rotaries that have been very supportive um, in a both um, where uh, we've appeared at a number of these organizations to talk about what we do um, and to make awareness is a big mm -hmm. part of how they can help. It's just to be aware um, that there is um, a large and growing population of immigrants um, in Champaign County um, and also being aware of the you know, organizations that can help those people um, uh, you get services and and help them get translation. So if they're if they're just aware of the refugee center, mm -hmm. if, if they ever encounter an occasion where they they're they've met somebody who's just come from an you know someplace else other than the U.S. Um, or you know 
find out about people who are in need, who are, who are immigrants, um, they can certainly call our office and um, we can arrange um, for, for um, people to come in and get an intake and see what kind of services we can offer. And I really think awareness is a, is a big key. Mm. We're not, um, you know, we're not just a college town here where it's, it's, a, it's really a growing international population. Um, and so if, just if people are aware of that, I think is a, is a bit, big help too. And not, and not just refugees, right? It is right. Immigrants right. in general. Not just, as a matter of fact, the vast majority of our clients are not refugees. Mm -hmm. Okay, because I know that every every year on campus there's this thing called Quad Day, where mm -hmm. different groups that go out there, and and at least up until a couple of years ago, uh, immigration forum would would go out there, and I'd end up sitting there all day talking to people, and a lot of people would just ask me like, how do I get this service, or how do I do uh, that sort of thing. And, uh, you know, I didn't realize that I could have given out your number and said, Hey, we'll talk to the refugee center because they can help you with that. Uh, so I would just generally take their information and ask around, but it, that's good to know. Yes. Um, because there are just, there are a lot of different kinds of weird problems that you just have, you know, when you're in a different country and yeah. even if you're not planning on moving there, you know, it's still, Right. Still a lot and one, one common problem that um, our uh, our clients often have is getting um, culturally appropriate food mm. to eat. Um, really? Generally, you know, our, our, our clients are mostly, uh, you know, below the poverty level, um, especially when they first arrive to, to our area. And um, food pantries are, are great, um, but some of the things that are offered, our clients aren't used to. And so mm. they're, you know, they they either turn it down or, or won't eat it. So um, there's been a push lately, and I know um, Eastern Illinois Food Bank's done a great thing in, in reaching out to organizations and asking about, um, asking some of our staff to um, participate in kind of a listening session about culturally appropriate foods. Um, I know that from our Afghan clients, their food is uh, tends to be expensive because their meat has to be halal. Mm. Um, so it has to be prepared in a certain way. And there are there are limited resources for that here. Um, so it tends to be to be more expensive. Mm. Mm. Yeah, there, there are a lot of different things like that, actually, that are, present like a barrier to mm -hmm. uh, just settling in. Uh, you hear a lot of people talk about assimilation like uh, well the goal is these people should try to assimilate but it's it's not that easy you can't just suddenly start eating hot dogs and going to baseball games and you know and right. putting an american flag on your house i mean it it that's not what assimilation is it might be what would make some people more comfortable mm -hmm. uh, but it's it's more it's learning how to fit yourself as you are right. with your various you know your backgrounds and in the, in the context that you come from into this new place in a way that works for everybody. And um, so beyond the legal stuff, are there ways that you uh, help people do that sort of thing? Sure. Um, we do cultural orientation. Mm. So, so that's, um, we have a lot of great resources, especially through the U S conference of Catholic bishops um, in many different languages that can teach um, our clients about things like the monetary system mm -hmm. and how to take the bus. Um, um, a lot of it is also, though, just that one-on-one -on -one staff client contact. Mm -hmm. um, we've had staff that will take the clients to the bus stop and show them what bus to, to take to get to their job or to go grocery shopping with them. We find that's particularly important when we have clients who participate in the WIC program, the Women, Infant, Children Nutritional Program, right? Uh, because there they get a list of the permitted foods and the quantities that they're um, allowed to buy. Mm. And then it has to be the, the cheapest price of, the, of that particular um, category, uh, like the, the generic milk or what have you. And then, and then our quantities are very different because we're we're practically the only ones who don't use the metric system. Yeah. So, you know, what's a dozen eggs? And what about, you know, 12 ounces? You know, they're, they're used to grams. So there's a lot of one-on-one -on -one assistance in those, uh, you know, beginning months of, of how to, to even just 
get on a bus, go to a grocery store, shop from your family and get back home. Mm-hmm. It's, it's really quite an effort just you know, from the very beginning. So, Is housing a difficulty? Housing is, is expensive um, as it is all across the nation. It's, mm-hmm. it's still, it's expensive here in Champaign-Urbana. Um, I find that um, while there is apartment buildings going up left and right, they tend to mostly be student apartments and that's not appropriate or affordable <clears throat> For our clients, right. so there is definitely a lack of affordable family housing in this mm. area. We were really fortunate. Um, we had worked with a lot of area landlords in the year prior to the Afghan um, evacuation because of COVID. Uh, we had offered a lot of direct assistance. We gave out about a million dollars in direct assistance, that paying rent, utility bills, um, buying food gift cards, and we did that through various state. Um, state, local, and private grants. Mm -hmm. So we had talked to a lot of landlords and said, okay, we're going to pay so-and-so's rent. Can you tell us what they owe? And can you give us a schedule so we have it for our records? Um, So they they knew who we were and they trust us. So when we had this large number of people that came over at once, we were able to go to some of them and and say, you know, we have have a need here. Mm -hmm. Um, What kind of availability do you have? and I'm, I'm very happy to say that um, we only had to put um, our Afghan clients in temporary housing for, I think two families were in temporary housing for one week each. Uh-huh. And then one group of men was in a extended stay hotel for a week. But then the apartments were ready and we were able to, to get them into um, permanent um, housing. So we were really, really fortunate, but it, it, it is difficult, it, especially for larger families. Afghan families are much larger than um, American families, and um, you know they. Um, for example, we have a family that's a family of nine, and mm-hmm. so that was a real challenge to find them some suitable space. But we've um, we've reached out into um, faith-based organizations and asked for um, some assistance, and they've really stepped up to the plate, um, offering everything from. They gave us um, new household goods for. Um, some of these uh, clients and um, offers of helping them find um, more permanent housing, maybe in a larger space than just an apartment. So we're um, we're really grateful to this this community for really stepping up and helping us. Mm, yeah, well, that sounds good. You must have a huge staff. Um, not so big. <laughs> we just work a lot. <laughs> so everybody wears like multiple hats and just like yeah, takes we them have, on. Yeah, we have um, we increased our staff dramatically since the beginning of the year, um, primarily with the Afghan resettlement team. So we're now, I believe, up to 16 employees, um, but some are part-time. Hmm. So we have a lot of, there's a lot of hmm. desire for part-time employment um, right now. Um, so we, we made that work by, by hiring different people part-time and um, trying to work as a team with the clients to try and, and get them the services they need. So these new grants are going to be helpful, but they're just going to get the ball rolling on some exactly. things, and then you're going to have to find some other way of keeping it going. Correct. Are you pretty confident that that's going to be, you're going to be able to sustain yeah. these things? Yes, I am. I think um, I think now that Champaign-Urbana is, is kind of on the map as far as being a place where a large amount of immigrants are coming to, and that's that's happened through um, through the grants we've received through COVID that have attracted a lot of attention from people mm-hmm. in Chicago and statewide. And then with the Afghan evacuation, um, they, they know that this is some place that can, that can serve these clients really well with the resources we have here, um, the, the huge number of jobs that are available here, all the industry we have here, plus the university. Um, I've spent a lot of time, and so is the rest of my staff, really educating people around the state about what there is in Champaign-Urbana. It isn't just a college town. We have all of these industries here that are hiring people, um, and there, there's just a large variety of things that that um, uh, that clients can uh, be doing here, can, uh, mm-hmm. different jobs that they can be qualified for, and there's a big need. So um, I, I do think that once we're on everybody's radar as, okay, there's a, there's a sizable immigrant population here in Champaign-Urbana. Let's see what we can do to get, you know, uh, more, uh, you know, the, the annual funding that 
we need to keep this kind of a, um, a project going. Mm -hmm. How about, um, I was reading something the other day about how difficult students, particularly Afghan students, in, in this article, but it probably holds true for others from around the world, uh, getting their credentials like transferred to so that you can kind of pick up where you left off and keep going rather than having to go back and start over. Are these are the jobs that you're talking about mostly like service level jobs? Uh, they are they are mostly service uh, either service level or factory. Um, jobs. Now we do mm -hmm. have some clients that came in um, with more credentials and we'll be working with an employment agency um, with for them. Um, but yes, a lot of most of the clients that came in um, had were our unskilled workers. So oh, we okay. were able to um, to reach out to a couple of area um, companies. Some came to us. Um, they're so you know they heard we were receiving Afghan uh, evacuees and, and came to us and can we hire them? Um, right now, we were able to um, work with Flexengate. They've been really cooperative, and they've hired a, a, um, a large number of our clients. Mm -hmm. And it's worked out well because of their location. They are located not very far away from where um, these men and these families live, and they're able to take public transportation there. Um, and that's worked out really well. Um, for, for other jobs, it is a definite <clears throat> barrier that degrees obtained overseas are not given full credit here. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes there is no easy way to to make that happen except to go back and start all over again. Um, we're hoping that that will change in the near future. Um, I know right now with the, the need for um, skilled workers is also great. So we're hoping um, with these uh, the last couple of families that came um, they are, they are, um, they have, uh, English acquisition and mm -hmm. they are more skilled. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll see, um, what kind of opportunities we can find for them in the community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, hmm. I've kind of asked everything that I can think of to ask. I mean, I, I just, I'll edit this part out, but I mean, I already knew most of this stuff, I, but I'm trying to think of questions that are mm -hmm. like the average person who knows nothing about this would ask. And so right. I'm kind of right. trying to. Well, I can, um, I can add, uh, we have received a few questions about Ukraine and mm. any Ukrainian immigrants that might be coming over. Um, my short answer uh, as to whether we'll be receiving any is I don't know. Uh, I know that's not very enlightening, but um, even though uh, President Biden said that the U.S. will admit 100,000 um, refugees from Ukraine, we have no idea what that system looks like right now. Usually with a refugee process, like I said before, they're spending, you know, many years at times applying to, for refugee status and waiting to receive that status. Mm -hmm. So I am not, we have not been told what will happen um, in this situation. Um, and as far as uh, we've had a few inquiries about um, U.S. citizens who are trying to get their family out of Ukraine, and unfortunately right now there aren't a lot of easy answers. Um, because if you don't have a visa already and if you don't have the paperwork, it's going to take some time before you can get the proper paperwork. Um, for example, um, you can to get a visitor's visa to come mm -hmm. to the U.S. You have to assure the U.S. government that you're not staying. So you, there has to be a, a limited time and a plan in place that you're returning. Well, that's not really possible mm -hmm. with um, with any people who are trying to flee the violence in Ukraine right, right. now. Right. Um, so there 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 aren't too many avenues that they can legally immigrate right now. Hopefully, um, the U.S. Uh, Customs and Immigration Service and the State Department will work something out, um, and and um, we st we stand ready to help whatever um, Ukrainian immigrants come to the area. We can also help um, those who are already in the country who now have temporary protected status. We can help them um, with resources to to make sure that they're uh, following the rules for temporary protected status and get employment authorization. Um, 
but it's unfortunately with all um you know without knowing what's going to happen tomorrow in the ukraine uh, it's hard for us to really say how many would even come to champaign urbana interestingly i've i've read a bit about uh the difficulties of russian persons who have have left the country and said okay i can't i can't yeah. stay here you know i don't support this i don't support what's going on mm -hmm. and they're having a hard time finding anybody that wants to let them in because right. of the the bad reputation that the country itself you know right. and its government has and they're kind of at a loss for where to go or what to do well i think a good first step would be to grant um russians um, temporary protected status as well uh -huh. so that you know first take care okay the ones that are already here even if your visa is expiring, you don't have to go back. We know that you would be, you know, if you, if you did not support the government, we know that you could be arrested or worse if you return. So right. I, I personally am in favor of granting temporary protected status to Russians that are already in the country. Yeah, that might be something that uh, my group could advocate for mm -hmm. uh, since that's the sort of thing that we do. But that's the kind of like strange that, not a lot of people are thinking about this, but there, this is an actual problem for a number yeah. of people, and it's very difficult. Uh, I've talked to several people that are in, interested in the idea of hosting refugees. Is that something that's done? And if so, how does one do it? Um, not normally. <clears throat> okay. Um, what normally, before the Afghan evacuation, when we received, um, uh, we were asked to receive a refugee family we give what's called assurance, but part of the rules with the resettlement agency is that we have to find them their own housing. Hmm. It is, unless unless it's a family member. Okay. Unless it's a family member, it's, it's kind of frowned upon um, to put them with with strangers. I see. So families families different, <clears throat> um, but so this was very unusual. With the Afghan evacuation, we did house two families with. Um, with U.S. you know local families that they never didn't know before, but it was only it was temporary, mm -hmm. and it turned out to be just for about a week each. Yeah. So when people talk about hosting families, that's not the usual practice. Mm -hmm. um, they they are usually we try as hard as we can to get them their own their own space, but people can host by offering um, support in terms of either financial support transportation support uh, a lot of our clients come here they they can't drive legally and mm. they don't have the money to buy a car sometimes bus schedules don't work with their schedules so transportation support is really important um just just um emotional support and i know that takes the the barrier there is language right right so um, but even just knowing that somebody's willing to learn a few you know words of your language and, and try and help you maybe get to the grocery store and, and back, um, I think is, is a big, um, it's, a, it's a great way to assist these families. Is there a system set up for how you would do it? Like, let's say I'm just like, okay, I'm retired and I'd, I really want to help out. Uh, mm -hmm. Do I just call you and say, give me yeah, something have, to do, um, assign me something? Yes, we now have a, um, a volunteer <clears throat> and outreach coordinator that's working with us to try and organize. You know, we do get a lot of requests and sometimes it's just a little overwhelming to try and manage all that uh, all mm -hmm. the data and who can volunteer when and so it's, it's a lot of scheduling so we have a volunteer and outreach coordinator and she's going to be working to direct people um, to work more directly with some of these families now that we've got them more settled do you have like a contact number or something that you could uh, email me or something yeah, that I'll i could put our, on the yeah our general office numbers 217-344-8455 and uh, we can get you connected to our um, our outreach and volunteer coordinator. Okay. And then she can she can contact you from there. Yeah, I, I like to know this stuff, and I think a lot of people, you know, these are some of the kinds of questions that people ask me, and I don't always have a good answer for them. Like, mm -hmm. I don't, you know, like I don't know if you can do that exactly. Yeah. But it, it not knowing, I mean, is it, just knowing what the rules are is really important. And right. it's helpful because I think there are a lot of people that would like to be helpful, but they don't know how. Right. And it's like, do I send my money to charities? Do I, you know, 
what do I do? So they end up posting a meme on their Facebook page or whatever. And, yeah. and that's like the best they can come up with because they don't right. really don't have any other idea of how to help. Uh, so right. it's good to, to have these avenues where you can sort of channel that energy. Mm -hmm. uh, right now it's with Ukraine and uh, not that long ago it was with Afghans. Um, and it'll be somebody else next week, right. you know, but, uh, well, it's important to remember too. And I, I'm trying to emphasize this with people that, yeah, we had the mass evacuation and most of them are already here, but the support that they need, it's it really is about a two year resettlement process from, um, you know, past clients that we've spoken to. It takes about two years to really get over that, um, you know, that feeling and, and mm -hmm. feeling more um acclimated to the area and feeling a little more secure um so it's a, it's a long process and there's a lot of bumps along the road you know as um you know for example as as they um, gain employment and earn more money well then some of their snap you know the snap benefits will decrease yeah um, so there's a lot of um a lot of adjusting and um you know expectations that have to be tempered in terms of um you know what what's possible within that first two years of arriving here mm -hmm. so it's the old uh don't give a puppy for christmas unless you're gonna follow through and and raise it because right you, there's a a lot more to it than just that initial oh this is great i helped out once right. you know you can't well you can do that <clears throat> are there well speaking of which are there one time opportunities that someone can help uh is it yes. just give some money or is there something that's like i just i'm motivated right now but you know i'm very busy and i can't do this right yeah i mean obviously there's <clears throat> financial support um actually this saturday um we are going to be joining with some of the other um immigrant centered organizations and there's going to be a family event at um, at our offices. We are in the lower level of the Champaign-Urbana Public Health District, and they're mm. offering a family event that there's going to be food and raffle prizes, lots of information for immigrants um, about the different services offered by the different organizations, and there's also going to be a COVID vaccine clinic. Uh -huh. And some fun stuff for our families and mm -hmm. some, some games, and I, they're going to, uh, they partnered with the um, University of Illinois College of Media. They're coming over and going to be taking um, some family pictures, which is something that, you know, that is an expense that when you're um, watching every every penny is something a family might not be able to do. So they're going to be taking some family pictures. That's great. Um, and we hope that it's going to be a good, um, fun, informational event and hopefully get some more shots in the arms and uh, uh, it'll be a, a great event. No, that sounds wonderful. I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but is there anything that we didn't talk about that you wanted to sneak in there? No, I think that's 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 about it. I think I've Okay. <laughs> I'm through talking to you, buddy. <laughs> I've had enough. <laughs> I'll put up with you as long as I could. Yeah. Uh, no, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing this information. And I know I learned some things. And I hope that the listeners uh, or watchers or whoever will learn something as well. Um, so I will share. You gave me your number in here. And I will share that information and whatever else I can find on your website. Um on our stuff and i thank okay. you very much for your time and great thank you so much it was my pleasure it was great thank you so much okay bye-bye bye-bye